My lovely genius farts. During this prime spring season, you need wholesome, convenient meals to energize you for warmer, more active days and keep you on track to reaching your goals, son. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit can help you fuel up fast with ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. And the cool thing about Factor that I personally enjoy the most, my friends, is they have 34-plus chef-prepared, dietitian-approved weekly options. So if you get tired of something else, you can try something new. Head to factormeals.com slash geniusbrain50 and use code geniusbrain50 to get 50% off your first box. That's code geniusbrain50 at factormeals.com slash geniusbrain50 to get 50% off your first box. This podcast is brought to you by ZocDoc, my friends. You've been stewing about a health problem you have? Well, guess what? I bet you're resorting to texting your group chat to get your friends' opinions about things that they don't know about. You're extremely unlikely to find the quality medical advice that's out there in your group chat, but you can find it from a doctor on Zoc. Doc. ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who are patient-reviewed, take your insurance, are available when you need them, and treat almost every condition under the sun. Go to ZocDoc.com slash genius and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash genius. ZocDoc.com slash genius. But I, I know it's ridiculous, right? Obviously, we don't live in a zombie apocalypse, but it does put into perspective of like what people complain about. Mm. There's a reason why I don't like people who whine, right? Yeah. And I'm not saying that we don't go through our own trials and tribulations because a lot of the times when when I, when you hear something from somebody like me or anybody else when they go through something. In five, four, three, two. One, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Genius Brain Podcast. I am your host, David So, and we have my reoccurring co-host, Ed Park, my friends. Uh, A lot of you guys out there don't know because some of you just listened to the audio. There are two Ed Parks. (laughs) And apparently both of you guys' voices sound very fucking familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's that that smoker's voice. (laughs) That's what it is. Yeah, there's two Ed Parks. There's Ed Drick yeah. Park, the guy that I do, uh, Secret Society, uh, the contemporary uh, fashion basics line that I that I have. And then there's Ed Park, the guy that was my roommate. Right also, here. we did video work together. Two separate people for the people who are listening on uh, the audio side. Um, for a while now, we have sat on doing this review. We haven't done a movie or show review in quite a while, actually. Mm. Um, and... Before we go into beef, we're going to do The Last of Us because we owe it to them. <laughs> we, we owe it to you guys for the last half. Now, the first half of The Last of Us was fucking intense. Yeah. And mind you, once again, I did not play the game. I had no idea what the show was going to be about. And this show took me by surprise of how fucking good it is and was. Yeah. Right. Obviously, star studded cast everybody is on their fucking game not a single person whether they played a small role in this series is a terrible actor they are yeah. all fucking they're amazing. all amazing yeah and one of the things that i do enjoy uh hearing about even though i didn't play the game is how much people who were avid fans of this game truly enjoy this show mm. and how they're keeping it very close to the source material yes once again for me it doesn't really matter i never played the game but to understand that they actually, they had the original writer or creator? The original creator, writer, director. He did all of that for the video game and then they paired him up with the guy who made Chernobyl on HBO. Oh. And so that's why we have a solid fucking adaptation. Yeah. It's so damn good. So the last episode that we stopped on stopped on was episode five, five. right? And that was with the blind, the, the, the deaf kid. The deaf kid, yeah. And where, you know, they saw their demise and then Ellie, and Joel have to keep moving on westward. Yes. From Kansas City. And that episode was fucking devastating. That shit yeah. shook me to my fucking core. I played the game once and I only played it once because it's too scary to play again for me. But all I remember was this is such a good fucking game that I'll never play again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I remember the beginning and I remember the end. I totally forgot everything in the middle. So when that scene happened, I was utterly shocked as well. Again, all over again. So wow. it was great to experience it again the same way. That's dope. Let's go into episode six, <clears throat> since you guys have all been waiting. So I obviously we watched this a while back. I watched it again uh, yesterday. Mm-hmm. And I sometimes forget how the, 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 the thing I appreciate about this show so much is that it's not just banking on its fandom. 
right? Mm, yeah. A lot of the times when series or just shows, whether it's comic book series or whatever, when they bank on the fandom, they kind of get away with a lot of shitty acting, writing, and storytelling, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. But even on episode six, what I enjoyed the most about it is right from the jump is how fucking entertaining the dialogue is. Yes. So in this scene, they're traveling because he's a uh, Joel is looking for his brother. Right. It's right? been a few months since the last episode. It's yeah. now winter. Yeah. It's now winter and they meet this Native American couple. Yeah. <laughs> and bro, that shit cracked me the fuck up. You know, when when you think about it too, like on it in itself with the writing on the paper, it, it's nothing without the right actors on the screen. Mm. Having that kind of, they seem like a couple who've been together for over 50 years. Yeah. You know, they're bickering and they're back and forth. It's just so money. Like they don't give a fuck. They don't give a fuck. They never know? gave a fuck even before the, the apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is just life yeah. for them. Except for the wife. She said, I never wanted to leave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's adorable yeah. too, by the way. So Joel and Ellie find this cabin. And they obviously infiltrated it. And they're kind of, quote, unquote, holding this lady hostage, waiting yeah. for her husband. And he has a gun. He pulls a gun on him, tells him to sit down and ask him where he's at, trying to confirm that he's not lying about their location. But this dude is so just, what? I don't give a fuck. Yeah. <laughs> you know? He has a gun pointed at him. <laughs> he's just sitting there. Yeah. He goes, did you tell him the real location? Yes. <laughs> the real location? Yes. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> They're such a great couple. But um, the essence of the scene is um, Joel looking for his brother. So he's looking for on the map where he could be, according to where their location is. And they say any further west of the river or some, I forget which way, but it's Dead Valley. Like nobody goes through and comes back alive and such. And they intimate, like they say, like, hey, if your brother's out there, He's probably dead. Yeah. Right. And then Ellie goes, you can't scare us. And then she goes, I scared him because yeah. Joel is shook. He's shook at the thought that his brother might be dead, mm -hmm. you know, after all these years. And so they leave the cabin and uh, Ellie steals a fucking rabbit and Joel has a fucking panic attack. And Ellie's like, what's going on? And he's like, shut up. Like nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like Manly mans it out. Yeah. And they keep walking and they come to the river that they speak of. They see a hydro plant, like a hydro plant uh, dam, right? Um, and that's when the group of people on their on horseback with their guns come in, surround them. They do the dog test uh, where the dog can sniff if they're infected or not. Yeah. And uh, pass the test, relief of tension. And they bring him in to take them to the commune. Um, and so when they come in, this commune is a fucking utopia <laughs> compared to everything we've seen. Yeah. Yeah. It's, everything is working. And Joel spots his brother. Uh, fuck. What's his brother's name? Uh, Tom? I can't fucking Bobby. Know. Tommy. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say Bobby. But um, Joel's um, incredibly relieved. And they catch up. They have a meal and then we learn that um, the lady who had, you know, had their, you know, guns pointed at him is Tommy's wife, wife. Yeah. Where now that Joel has been there, he thinks he's there to save Tommy. Tommy's like, I've been okay. I'm fine. Yeah. Right. And he has all these plans of what they're going to do. Not that he's alive. He's like, I have a life here. This is my wife, you know, and, you know, this is what I'm doing. I'm not doing anything This is else. such a weird part for me because, I, you know, up until this point in the show, you actually don't know much about Joel, right? right? You just know that he's a very guarded human being because of the death of his daughter, yeah. right? This episode for me, the way that Tommy was kind of treating his brother kind of gave me a glimpse into how vicious uh, Joel is. Right. And Tommy is like semi afraid of him. Afraid of him. Like yeah. his own brother. This is, like how Joel loves his brother. Obviously, his brother loves him back, right? And we've seen this in the beginning of the episode when he saved him and everything else. They have a great relationship. But there's parts of the story that's missing that we don't know about Joel. Yeah. He has a reputation to himself. Right. You know and, what I mean? The reputation being that he's a killer. He's a fucking killer. But what do they mean by killer? 
mm-hmm. right? And it turns out that Joel used to be a part of Fedra. Yeah. He used to stay in line and he would kill innocent people like the way they did, if they were infected or not, it was an emergency situation. And he was one of those soldiers when he was telling that story to Ellie back in episode three, it's something he sounds like he participated in. Mm-hmm. And Tommy was doing that, they say, because he was trying to survive with his brother mm-hmm. and just following his brother, but it was not something he wanted to do. And Joel's argument was like, that's what, that's the same for me too. I was just trying to survive. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a weird moment too where obviously, you know, we're seeing a lot of Joel's human side. Yeah. And there's a point in the film where you're going around, you get to see the world that they've created, right? They have movie nights. Right. Um, you see like the horses in the all, stable. They have livestock. They they have all different kinds of um religious backgrounds mm-hmm. too. And then they're like, We're communists. Communist. <laughs> And Joel gives Tommy a dirty look. Yeah. Communist. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's from Texas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Commie. Yeah. Um, and uh, they, have a, they have a very heart-to-heart moment. And this moment, man, I got to tell you, the level of acting of Pedro Pascal is fucking amazing, yeah. man. When he was sitting there pleading to his brother to take Ellie in, right? Right. And kind of telling, like exposing himself about how of like the heinous stuff that he's done. Like he knows it. He knows how terrible. Right. Are you talking about um, later at night, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before that, where they're in the bar, they have some contention too. Mm-hmm. Because he wanted to, I want to speak along with my yeah. brother. And then what we're seeing in, from Joel's side is like all these years, I thought you could have been dead. And everything I did to keep going was to find you and make sure alive. And he's you're trying. just, yippity doodah yeah and then his brother's like just because life stopped for you doesn't mean it stopped for me yeah and you start noticing that relationship that joel has with tommy in their brotherly relationship is pretty toxic yeah for him to drag his own brother into his misery because his daughter died yeah you know but he's like and then he reveals my wife's pregnant she has a baby coming and so all these things that you have planned, you want me to go with you to take this girl over there? Like, no. Yeah. Now I have my own girl to take care of. And then that's where they get into arguments. Like, that's not even your daughter. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? And then I guess, uh, I guess he leaves that bar in like anger and he gets another panic attack. And he sees an image of what I'm guessing is a mixed girl with big curly hair and sees what he thinks is his daughter, but this girl has her own daughter. And then you can see that if if you're just reading character, that he must be thinking if his daughter was still alive to this day. You know, I think a lot of people had mixed feelings about that moment, right? Mm. Because- I saw that on Twitter. People were saying, what, Joel's not a pussy? He doesn't get panic attacks? Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah. Shit like that, yeah. People, People have very mixed feelings. And I think that sometimes, when people watch shows like this, right, there is an image of a person that you see that the, that the writing shows on a surface level, right. But you're not looking into all the little Easter eggs the show's giving you right, about how complex this human being is. Mm -hmm. Even that relationship between him and his brother, I think a lot of people didn't understand because they, they're only looking at it from the view of, Oh, Joel is over here sacrificing his comfort and his life to find his brother. How dare his fucking brother, you yeah. know, just sit here and enjoy his life while his brother's actually, who loves him is looking for him. He didn't look for his brother. Right, that's right. But So you can understand Joel's resentment yeah. in that sense, but that's not the whole picture. It's not the it's whole the picture. It's the guy you were controlling on the controller. So mm-hmm. you have this attachment to this character. Yeah. But in that's, that's another thing I want to bring up um, is the fact that the people who didn't like the show we're saying, oh, it's not like the game. It's like, yeah, because it's a fucking game. Yeah. It's interactive. You control the character mm-hmm. kind of thing. You make these decisions kind of thing. That, that's what it takes away from. But that's the fucking reality of fucking movies, all right? There's no smell vision quite yeah, yet, yeah, 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 all right? Yeah. You know, we're working on it with 3D. Yeah. So it's like, you know, chill the fuck out and respect the medium. And it's telling you the fucking story. Yeah. <laughs> and that's... and. 
So how I would have done it, it's, yeah, like, it's like, yeah, but not, you were playing a game, yeah. right? And now we actually get to see what humans actually are like yeah. when they interact with each other. And obviously like sibling relationships are very complicated, mm -hmm. you know, and there's something that happened between them that even we don't really know about, but they can only allude to it through their conversations. His brother almost seems to me from that, he's like, I almost want to forget everything that we did in yeah. the past, Yeah, right? You're trying to move me and take me into this world that I've been trying to forget for the longest time. I found a new life. I'm happy here. Yeah, it's like, safe. Yeah, let me live in this reality. And I think for him, he, he's accepted like this is this is what it is, and we are going right. to live here. Right. You know, and his brother obviously has a different mission, and he's not really considering the fact that his brother has a new life. He goes, "No, you're my brother. You come with me." Yeah. <laughs> you know, which culminates to the meeting. I don't know if it was like a hardware store or some shit. Um. It was in the he's dark. Sitting, he was yeah, he's sitting alone in the dark and his Tommy comes and finds him and Joel finally, it, we see what the, all those panic attacks were up, about. What was creeping up on him was this sense of fucking failure mm -hmm. that he's failed when his daughter died. He failed when Tess died, he, you know, and, you know, at the cabin, that panic attack was the real reality that his brother might be dead. But now that his brother is alive, it's that's not enough for him. The fact that his brother is alive, but that he's gonna go alone with Ellie mm -hmm. into with the rest of this mission, and him seeing that image of his daughter gave him that panic attack feeling, that sinking feeling, like he's going to fail this. I'm going to fail this too because I failed at everything. And so now you see the alpha character, you know, actually start being vulnerable. You know, the only person he could be vulnerable with is his brother. Yeah. And so this whole time, what he couldn't be for years and why he was so hardened was, and why he couldn't be real with anyone, you know, was he didn't have that person with him, which was his brother. And when he opens up like that and he's saying like, you got to take her, I'm going to get her killed. Yeah. To the point where his brother finally agrees because he tells him she's immune, mm -hmm. you know? And so he sees the bigger picture and the bigger mission. So his brother accepts. But then Joel now has to go talk to Ellie about what's going to happen. What's interesting is when he walks into the bedroom that she's staying in, she's reading a diary. And she says, is this what everyone had to worry about? What kind of shirt matches with their skirts <laughs> and talking to boys? Yeah. It's so bizarre. You know, and what the that's world was like before what the world everything was else. Like. Yeah. And all these things we still take for granted. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, it was yeah that was pretty poignant for me like to really look at how much like where our world's at and then the reality these people I, live and, in. I, and i fucking loved that part yeah. right um i'm not sure if that part was either in the game or not or if it's a, a consistent trope in the game mm -hmm. but I, I know it's ridiculous right obviously we don't live in a zombie apocalypse but it does put into perspective of like what people complain about mm -hmm. the, there's a reason why i don't like people who whine right yeah and i'm not saying that we don't go through our own trials and tribulations because a lot of the times when when I, when you hear something from somebody like me or anybody else when they go through something and we we hear them out we comfort them and then we try to give them a, an alternative perspective people go oh you're dismissive of my feelings mm. or your perspective is fucked and what you're complaining about isn't that big of a deal and you're allowing these things to eat you up yeah life yeah. is short yeah. <laughs> you know but like her that's why you know, look, you know, we talk a lot about our Christian faith and what, what has happened in our religion, right? But one of the things that I'm very grateful for is miss missionary trips. Yeah. Missionary trips put a huge perspective in my life that I never experienced before because I truly, people can tell you as much as you want. Man, there are people out there who are starving, who don't have what you have. You should be grateful. It's all words. Yeah. When you see it in person, yeah. it fucking flips your script like none other happier people too somehow yeah they're Not happy, happy. <laughs> bro like even in like i'll forever remember this in uh in because uh, i only I, I went on two mission trips well, obviously one was to mexico but talking to the kids out there right where you have a translator and they're yeah. telling you what they're saying to you and i'm scared of these stray dogs and this kid's laughing at me and and then the guy's translating his spanish to me and he goes he finds it funny that you're scared of these dogs when god is walking with you every day it's a fucking child. Bing. Yeah, you know? It's a fucking child. That changes your perspective on yeah. things. And you don't hear him complaining about life or whatever. You know, this is this is like what has happened to 
how we live now. Yeah. Why Twitter, why it's so easy for us to complain about everything because actually things are so fucking great that the thing that you're worried about the most is whether somebody calls you Zer in. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. Which, yeah, is a real problem for you. Yeah. I, I understand. You know, this is just a society. This is how great things are. Yeah. But if you if if you kind of put things in perspective, I felt like a lot of the times, like for me when I was younger, I didn't complain a lot either because I was so worried about just fucking paying my bills. Yeah. It's kind of going on about life. If you kind of put in perspective of like how great things are, it's kind of trippy. And when you that that little diary moment was yeah. was that. Yeah. You know? So um that that trope will keep coming up in, in subsequent episodes. Um, but they have a big falling out where he tells her, like, you're not my daughter. Fucking vicious dude, just right. fuck it. <laughs> right. And she's like, go ahead, then leave me just like everybody else. She's she's essentially feeling what he feels. Mm -hmm. And like that whole conversation that she had is like, damn, you're like talking into your reflection and he has to hear that shit. And she says, I lost people too. I know what it is to understand to lose. And then he tells her, no, you don't. You don't know what it's like to lose, which is a false statement. Something yeah. he doesn't, we'll learn, we'll talk about it in the next episode. But he, they leave the room and he goes back to his spot. And then he has this flashback of Christmas and his daughter. And then I think that alone, like harkens back to his whole reason why he's even there. As much as he keeps saying, my brother, my brother, I'm there, go see my brother. The reality was his brother's perfectly fine. Yeah. He went there with, because he's protecting Ellie. Mm -hmm. He went there because of what the entire reason through whether Tess imparted in him or not was that, you know, this is someone that is like his second chance at saving somebody like his daughter. Yeah. You know, and doing something greater and bigger like the way his daughter was, mm -hmm. was just this sweet girl. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? It's interesting because you know, I, I mean, I guess I kind of expected it, but in the way, he's so, such a macho dude, even the, so Ellie obviously ends up going with him, but you mm -hmm. know, they're at the stable. Yeah. He'll listen, I deserve to give you a choice. He goes, I'm going with you immediately. Yeah, immediately. <laughs> you know? Like not even a sec, didn't even need a thought. Mm -hmm. Right. But he, it's funny how he opened it up. Like, yeah, I was just stealing this horse. Yeah. <laughs> I started to be all manly about it. Because we would have, Giving it to you. Yeah. Because I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, this episode ends with um They get the, to the 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 lab. firefly lab. Yeah. yeah, where they, they think that they're going to be nobody's there. So when they come out of it, there's these marauders, the raiders, yeah, who attack them and Joel fights one off and breaks that guy has a baseball bat. It breaks the bat and then Boom, clat, I think he breaks his neck. Fucks him up, kills him. him out. And then Ellie's like, oh shit, Joel. And he got stabbed with the end of the fucking bat. Dude, fucking Jack, dude. Yeah. You know what the part that fucking annoyed me? That not, not from a film perspective. It's like these guys came to jump and kill him. And then the people who came there was like, they came back and they're like, I can't believe you did this to my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the next episode you right. pay for this it's like no. yeah. i'm like wait what the fuck are you talking oh, about gosh. so um they get away but joel falls off the horse later and he's dying and ellie tells him like you can't fucking die because i'll die mm -hmm. you know like i can't do this without you fade the black so going into our next episode She's dragged him into this abandoned neighborhood, this house, takes him into the basement, um, doesn't know what the fuck to do. She's like telling Joel, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And he grabs her and he says, just get out of here. Leave me. You have to leave me. You know, and tells her to go, pushes her away. And she does her usual attitude, fuck you thing, turns around to leave. She stops at the stairwell and then we flash back. And this is the rest of the episode um, where basically what happened chronologically before we saw, you know, the current day is we see what Fedra is on the inside. Ellie is going to this military school. It looks like a regular high school just stuck in time. Yeah. You know? 
she's getting bullied. She punches a girl because that girl makes a joke about Ellie's friend, right? Who used to fight for her, but now she's gone. And so Ellie fights her. Then she gets put into um, what I'm assuming is a school authority, like, a, but he's a military guy. And then he tells her, he gives her the pep talk about what life is like. You know, you're one of the smartest, brightest. If you just did what I'm telling you to do, you know, you don't have to go outside of the walls. You could stay inside. Go ahead, just do an admin job. Get the best food you can. Get a hot shower, you know. You know, have your own spot, this and that. Don't You don't have to scrounge around like everybody else. Where, you know, she's like, okay, fine. You know, like what, what we're getting as an audience in this scene in, is how Fedra is just like every other idea that's going around is just trying to survive. Yeah. You know, although they are fascists, like on the inside, it's like all these people bureaucratic people just trying to live just yeah. trying to survive their reality and so the next scene we're seeing ellie in her room um and the other bed in her bunk the whoever she's sharing the room with is completely empty she's missing we're assuming that's her friend that's missing she thinks she's been dead so ellie's been worried and then her friend busts in to surprise her and so they basically just have this big adventure where she takes her to the mall, right? And in the mall, um, she has this whole thing set up for Ellie, you know, because they're such close friends. Like she wants to show her the wonders of the mall, something Ellie has never seen or experienced. And like they go to a photo booth, they go to an arcade, they do such things. But they also, what's going on is they're like talking about why they are where they are. And Ellie not knowing anything better than, I guess this is the life, you know, it's just I have to do what Fedora, say, Fedora, Fedora says and I'll just be part of Fedora. But for her friend, I'm like forgetting her name. <laughs> this is an important character to the show. You know, this episode too, people hated this episode, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear that a lot. They fucking hated this episode. Like they did not like it at yeah. all. And I understand people's sentiments, right? I think... There's a, definitely a lot of like good information for you to understand who Ellie is before everything else, right? Because we never really got a backstory of this girl. Uh, we just kind of know she, about Bill and you know, yeah. and and his whole situation and his whole love story. Yeah, and we do Ellie. Yeah, and I think what happened was because of that, there was a comparison mm. between Bill and his love story and this because it's kind of revealed that Ellie is uh is gay. Yeah, right. That friend of hers is like she's in love with her. Yeah, right. And I think because they had this whole beautiful setup for Bill and his partner, that this one kind of fell short for everybody. Yeah. It just kind of seemed like they people enjoyed the backstory of kind of who her character was in the federal school system. This love story served no purpose for them. Right. It, yeah. This part of the story, though, is actually, it was a DLC of the game. Mm -mm -mm. I remember playing this part. Um, but it came out afterwards as like Ellie's side story where you just play as her ah, okay. and where she came from. So they included it into the story. If you notice, this whole season is completely nonlinear. We time jump all over the place all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I understand that too, like how it is important. But the second time around as I was watching, I skipped it. Yeah. I skipped it till they got to the dialogue so I can understand why they're there. <laughs> now that I've given credit to the episode, I hated this episode. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was fucking useless as shit. I don't think we fucking need it. I think we needed the first half. Yeah. But their love, you know, it's like anything that, that you watch, right? When you don't set up a why for the what, mm -hmm. you don't fucking care. Yeah. Their love interest thing, I could give a fuck less about. Right, right. You know what I mean? Versus the other bill episode you got to see why their love was important right this was kind of it it could have just been her friend it could have been anything i'm going to defend this episode even though it is slow i'm going to defend its purpose and the reason why it's in there and the whole point of it being a dlc because it wasn't in the original release of the game um apparently they hadn't finished that part and okay. so they released it later as a dlc because, you know, 
we're already talking about the show. You know, it serves its purpose at the end of the show because Ellie had approval point, not approval point, but reiterate the fact that she has lost people, but Joel didn't believe her. Like yeah. we were just saying in the last episode. And the so for that purpose, I understand. So they had the DLC to show Ellie's story about what she's talking what about she's at lost. the end of the game. Yeah, what she's lost. The other part of me, and you can call it ageist if you want to, is I think I am not a fan of today's Hollywood catering Gen Z into everything. Mm -mm. I, I know what you're saying. And that so, was the biggest cri critique of this episode. Yeah. Ant-Man and the Wasp. Mm -hmm. It's called Ant-Man and the Wasp, except it was about Ant-Man and his daughter. Yeah. And so the whole thing we were joking about the other time before was Evangeline Silly, who is the titular character. Her character t is in the fucking title, has nothing to do in the movie. Instead, everything's going on with um, Ant-Man's daughter. And what the fuck is she even doing? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is her purpose? And like, just look at everything. And even her character as before, like, you just went through a huge trauma where you thought your dad was dead for five years and you had a whole life without him. And then he came back and everybody came back, except you're just perfectly fine, happily, bubbly, no issues about it. And instead it's about how Gen Z can rise up and take up power and fight and be superheroes. It's a very childish way of t saying yeah, something yeah, yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. you know? And then Thor Love and Thunder is just like kidnap children, you know? Okay. Guardians of the Galaxy, kidnap children. Oh, okay. There's always this like catering to that. But when you look at why they would do it, it's because, oh, kids love the MCU. Kids are the ones that love Iron Man. Mm -hmm. But look at the first Iron Man. It's not a fucking kids movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not at all. It's 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 hard PG thirteen. I mean, we're seeing this a lot in like television shows and film. And the thing about that is, it's if people haven't figured it out, people only go where the money is, and they're trying yeah. to figure it out. Their whole marketing is based on that, right? Yeah. Which you know, film and TV shows suffer from it because they're just trying to figure out a way to get the most eyes on this, even mm -hmm. if like the story suffers from it. And and you know, it's. It's the Hollywood fucking game, right? We've seen it so many times. That's why I'm always so critical about um, celebrities who constantly talk about, you know, representation and the things that all this trouble in the world. It's like, if this didn't affect your job, you would never say anything. Mm. You don't actually care. You could always just shut the fuck up and not say anything at all. You know, yeah, yeah. you could just chill, but you know, they, they know that if they say this, that they'll get glorified for it. Yeah. So they'll do it. It's just the Hollywood cycle of things. And then, you know, art, the art kind of suffers for it Yeah, all the time. It happens yeah. all the fucking time. Well, we're seeing like their reasons and purposes with Ellie's friend. She got sewage duty. So she's like, look at my life in Federa. For the rest of my life, I'm just going to be guarding a gate for people to shovel shit. Yeah. You know, and they have already told you, you're going to be in the upper, you know, officers, you know, like, and I, I'm, I'll never get there if I'm down here kind of thing, which is just like the way fascism, I guess, works in their world. And, um, but despite, you know, whatever background and beliefs they have, they have their moment together uh, where they kiss that one beautiful moment that been building up. But just like the show does, immediately it takes it away from them. And one of the cordyceps zombies shows up. They fight it off. They think they've won, but they're both bit. Yeah. And Ellie, this is before she even knows she's immune. You know. And then they have a talk together about, well, what do they do now? And they said there's two options. It's like we blow each other's brains out right now and die, or we just continue. Right? She's like, what do you mean continue? There's nothing like yeah. after this. You know, she's like, you know, whatever happens, happens. It's like, we just keep going on. We live as what we know we are. And then we just lose our minds together. Right. And what's option three? There's no option three. So she cries in their arms and it just goes to black. And we catch back up to Ellie at the staircase. And she goes frantically 
looking for some medicine, something to patch him up. And she finds like a needle and thread, goes in there and do it, does a fucking rinky dink sew job, you know, fucks him up <laughs> essentially, yeah. but you know, sews him up and then um basically just sits and waits there and then the episode ends. So I could see why this is a very unlikable episode for a lot of people yeah, yeah, where yeah. it's kind of like nothing happened. Nothing happened. Anticlimactic, yeah. but I get it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think this was, this was literally the worst rated episode. So people were just mm -hmm. dying for the next one. Like hurry up and end this fucking episode so I can see what happens next. Right. And then in, in the next episode, where are we starting? This is she's in the house. So she's in the house. She's patching up. She has to go out and look for food. Yeah. Right. This episode, by the way, is fucking nuts. Right, right. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Episode eight. A this fucking religious episode. Episode is fucking yeah. nuts. And this one was the highest rated of the season. So it was like back to back, a stinker yeah. and then a great one. Yeah. The best one of this. Not, well, obviously, we're gonna, you know, break this episode down, but my God, this episode fucking wrecked me. <laughs> yeah, there was just so much going on in one with like all this deception and manipulation where even in the audience, we bought into this character, David, his manipulation for the first minute, right? <laughs> he seemed half. like the kindest person ever. The like he's guy. either like a misunderstood human being yeah. that has like the best intentions for things, right? So Ellie is has to go hunt for food, right? And in the previous episodes, we didn't mention this, but there was a part where Joel had like this moment with Ellie where he's teaching her how to use right, the rifle. Because right, right. he fell asleep while he was supposed to guard and she was like, you fell asleep, so I'm doing it. So she wants to take up more responsibility mm -hmm. and learn how to survive. So she actually kills like a deer or a stag or whatever yeah. it is, right? Uh, along the way, there are two other people that are there. And they see her kill, but they don't know who killed this deer. Yeah. Ellie being a fucking gangster is like, yo, back the fuck away. She basically has them at gunpoint. Yeah. And has them throw away their weapons. And they kind of make a deal. Like, um, she basically finesses them and he basically tells her throughout their conversation that they have medicine. Yeah. Right? Because she needs it. So he's like, cool, I'm gonna keep this guy hostage. You go get the medicine and then what was it? They were gonna split the 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 deer. Something like that. Yeah. It, it, it was some kind of deal, right? Yeah. And this guy, David, is being very fucking chill about yeah. everything. And he's dead honest. He's keeping it real. Like he tells the dude, go back to the camp and get uh, two shots of penicillin. He's like, it's not a code. Like, it's like, just yeah. go and d go, don't do it. You know? And, and you see him just kind of questioning his choices. Mm -hmm. Like, what the fuck? What do you mean? It's not a code. Just go get the penicillin, which is what she needs because he has this infection. Yeah. And that's the thing that's going to help him. So I think it cuts to them. They made a little fire and they have their own little conversation, right? And he talks about like cheap drops, like, what are you in some cult? And he's like, yeah, I'm actually a preacher, but I'm a good guy. You know, I'm just, I, they chose me to be their leader, you know, and they want, you know, and so I'm taking care of just this commune of people. You know, you should actually come and join us. And, you know, she does her thing like, fuck you. And then he's, so honest, in fact, that he says, you know, knowing that you need this medication, you know, there was someone in our camp, you know, who died fighting some guy who's, you know, who he stabbed and they said he, he had a little girl with her. And then she's like, oh shit, <laughs> like that's me, right? And he's like, see, I know this whole time, you know, but I'm just, you know, I just want peace too. You know, let's, let's chill out. And then dude comes with a gun and David still tells his guy, his name is James. He's like, put the gun down, give him medication. And she runs He's off. He's so confused. Yeah. Goes, and so the James is like, going what on? are you doing? Yeah. Right. So Ellie goes down there and she shoots him up with the penicillin. Ironically, penicillin comes from fungus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it saves Joel's life. Um, Obviously, she has no idea what the fuck she's doing, you know, and um, I think time passes. So they go back to the camp to get more men, right? And then she uh, is puts in the next dose, I think, the next day. And when she goes out 
to get water or snow for water or something. She sees that these men are in the neighborhood looking for her. Yeah. She tries to make a run for it on the horse. The James dude shoots the horse, knocking Ellie over, and she gets knocked out. And then they see her and they're like, let's kill her. Yeah. Right. And even though David already had made a point, don't, don't kill her. Kill her. Right. And James is about to kill her. And then he catches them, stops him from killing her, picks her up, and says, I'm going back to the camp. You two drag that fucking horse because you're probably going to eat it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, we should, we should go back to the intro of David too. Because when he's introduced, oh, yes. they're in their commune, like a steakhouse, right? It's like mm -hmm. a big restaurant. So it's everybody's like a log singing. cabin restaurant or something. Yeah, yeah. And he's giving the verse from Revelation about what, you know, the, what heaven is like, what the new kingdom is basically, you know, there'll be no more tears or death or sadness. And the girl's crying because her dad died. And then she asks him, can we bury him now? Yeah. Immediately. And he looks over her and they're like, well, no, the ground is too cold and hard. We'll wait till spring to bury him. And so um, we, we see that they're not in good condition. They're starving people, right? So that, that's why they're always out there. And then I guess we get the information that they only have like five weeks left of food or something yeah. of venison. <laughs> and um, David questions James's faith. Like, are you still in it with me? Right? Are you still following me to see if James has his trust? But then you see how that's contended when James isn't listening to him trying to kill this girl. And so what we learn is like they put Ellie in a cage and David comes to talk to her again. But Ellie's smarter this time. The first time in front of that fire when she was so immersed with his manipulation because he's a preacher, mm -hmm. right? Until he reveals that, hey, I know who you are. In the same way, he's trying to fucking manipulate her about giving her a life here. And he says, I see you as an equal, you know? And what we're starting to really see is like just that creepiness he has about when him. You like were, he wants her. When you were hearing him talk, was it irritating you? Because it was irritating the fuck out of me. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I think it's because I've had my fair share of preachers I fell into because they were such dynamic speakers. Yeah. And then you realize you're kind of a piece of shit. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I started, like, it didn't really hit me until he started talking to Ellie, you know, like this promise. Like, who are you doing this for? There's a, there's a greater picture that you don't really see. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, he's doing the fucking pastor talk. Mm -hmm. The stuff that we used to get when we were younger. And they did it so fucking well. Yeah. I, I, so creepy. And like, I'm not even sure if that's what the writer intended, but they, if he didn't intend it, then God damn, you encapsulated yeah. the creepy pastor really well. A hundred percent they intended yeah. it. Yeah. Because uh, I was listening in. I mean, I'll talk about it after we, we finished about this episode yeah. specifically. Because, um, I mean, in the cage, Ellie sees a fucking ear yeah. on the floor. And then you're, previously, you know, we saw them like cooking up a stock and a guy brings a bucket full of meat and then he just sarcastically is like more venison. Yeah. And so we're, as the audience, we're kind of starting to piece it together, right? What the fuck it actually is. Because the next shot, they bring in the deer Ellie killed earlier. So wait, that's not the deer. Yeah. Right. And they're sitting and waiting and he... You know, they come in to eat, they give the prayer and, oh, importantly, when he comes in, everybody knows that they've caught this girl. So there's yeah. this weird vibe in the air. So he says, yeah, we're going to, this, but we're not going to be violent. We're going to bring justice to them. Right. And then the girl whose father died. She wants vengeance. Up. She wants vengeance. She's like, we should kill him. We should kill him right now. He walks up and fucking smacks her. And then he says, like, you might think you don't have a father, but you do, right? And this is that religious manipulation and gaslighting kind of technique where it's like they're talking about God, you know, when they talk about submitting to authority and stuff, but narcissists who run a church are talking about themselves. Yeah. When they say God in reality, they're trying to get through your head that, no, you have to do what I say because I'm saying what God says. Yeah, I am yeah. God. 
Yeah. I am his vessel. So you're starting, he's opening up more of his character traits about what's going on behind all of that front in this guy and it's getting more and more creepy. So when he's in that cage, he's trying that game again on Ellie, but Ellie is fucking smart. She fell for it the first time. She's not going to do it the second time because she draws in closer. She's like, yeah? Oh, and then grabs his finger and fucking breaks, breaks it. that shit. She, she fucking pulled a fast one on him, manipulated him into believing her words. I thought that was pretty smart writing to get what she wanted. Was yeah. to, I'm going to fuck you up no matter what. Yeah. Now, you know? And in that case, it made him, I think he dropped the keys. Yeah. Right. And then, um, so he leaves the room, threatens to chop her up and eat her. And then uh, I think she, I forget if she gets herself out or they, they fucking grab her. Shit, I can't remember. Anyways, well, James, his assistant, and David have her tied down to the fucking butchering table. Mm -hmm. He's about to fucking chop her up with this knife, butcher's knife. She goes, I'm infected. And then shows him the fucking bite. The bite, and he looks. But in doing that, he lets go of her arm. So she grabs the fucking cleaver and whacks it over and hits fucking James right in the neck, that clavicle bone right there. And she books out of there. And David doesn't even give a fuck. Yeah. He never cared about James. He always looked at him with content. I think he looked at everyone in that camp. They're not this equal to the, him. Yeah, this is what the writers of the show were saying. Like, nobody's equal to him except how, what he saw in Ellie. Mm. But the way he saw it wasn't like, come reign with me in this fucking shithole commune forever. It's just, that doesn't matter. I want you. Yeah. I have to have you. Fucking manic, narcissist, creepy, like, to the max. Yeah. And I think that cuts towards Joel's situation. There was a, two other guys searching for him. And... Joel is getting better because of the, the penicillin, penicillin is working. working and he hears them coming into the home. And so he hides out in the basement and even in his weakest state, he's killing smart. My lovely genius farts. During this prime spring season, you need wholesome, convenient meals to energize you for warmer, more active days and keep you on track to reaching your goals, son. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit can help you fuel up fast with ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and tackle everything on your to-do list. Look, if you're too busy to cook this made with Factor, skip the trip to the grocery store and skip the chopping, prepping, and all that other BS. Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals are just ready in uh, two minutes, and they freaking taste delicious. I actually got sent a bunch of them. I destroyed all of them because they were so good and it's based on the convenience i like convenient delicious food and the cool thing about factor that i personally enjoy the most my friends is they have 34 plus chef prepared dietitian approved weekly options so if you get tired of something else you can try something new head to factormeals.com slash genius brain 50 and use code genius brain 50 to get 50 percent off your first box that's code genius brain 50 at factormeals.com slash genius brain 50 to get 50 percent off your first box my lovely genius farts, this podcast is brought to you by Zuck Doc. My friends, you're trying to find a cause for your symptoms and you stumble down a TikTok rabbit hole full of questionable advice from so-called experts. <laughs> well, guess what? That 13-year-old doesn't know booty. There are better ways to get the answers you want and the care you deserve from trusted professionals and not random little children on the internet that thinks your pimple on your face is something more than it actually is. My friends, ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who are patient-reviewed, take your insurance, are available when you need them, and treat almost every condition under the sun. Let me tell you something. I'm a bit of a hypochondriac, and I love ZocDoc for that. I want my information, especially when it comes to my health, to come from licensed professional doctors, my friends. And that's why I love ZocDoc. Go to ZocDoc.com slash genius and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C.com slash genius. That's ZocDoc.com slash genius. He does just that one death blow, like that neck, like knife right to the neck, like the fucking Vegas tobacco shop. Yeah. You know? And then he can't even hold his own weight down and falls on him. And that guy had the fucking gnarliest death. Yeah. Where it's like, I don't know if he was smiling or some shit, but that was such a fucking creepy death. 
Dude, this this whole Joel's scene, unaffected. This whole scene. So this kind of always this kind of ties back to, you know, for me when his brother Tommy was talking and every you know the writing was alluding to how much of a monster Joel is. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and we've seen glimpse of this. Yeah. And obviously we'll see this later on in the episodes too. You'll see even even the bigger picture of how, why people knew who he was. Like you have to understand, Fedra is huge. Why do people know Joel so fucking well? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like how come, why, why does he have this reputation? It's probably ruthless. Ruthless. And you yeah. see it in this fucking moment. And obviously now, now not only was he heartless before, but imagine his level of killing when he's not heartless and he has yeah. something to care for now. Yeah. It's different now. Yeah. Dude, the way that he killed, it it always sh- it shook me a little bit, right? Because I'm always, he's a human being and I'm expecting to have some humanity. But it's like, <laughs> it's, it's not, gone. It's, it's gone. gone. If you gone. fuck with Ellie, uh-uh. Dude. But Bill alluded to that in the letter. Mm. He's like, no motherfucker is going to get in our way of our purpose. Yeah. That's how you and I are like. And now we're seeing it. He had this. So in this scene, um, for those of you who haven't watched this and are listening to this, it was so vicious because he has this buck knife stabbed into this guy's thigh, right? And he's extracting information because he's trying to find out the fucking camp. And it's like, yo, if you lie, I'll fucking know and I'm going to kill you. Gets the knife and he puts it in his mouth and he has him point at it, right? He goes, I'm going to have your buddy point at the same spot. And if you're lying, you're fucking done. And he points at the spot because obviously he wrenches that knife. Yeah. He points at the spot. He goes, thanks. And he fucking stabs him right through his chest anyways. Yeah. And his friend she's like jesus why did you kill him and he's tied up and it's like yo <laughs> oh, what, what am i watching <laughs> like, yeah it's like he's he, like why'd you do that he's crying for his friend he's like he told you where it was and he goes i know i believe him and he fucking bashes his head bashes in. his head and the, oh my god <laughs> the gr- great and the sick part about this is when joel kills look at his face nothing nothing when lights are see- on nobody's home when you see other people who murder somebody in films, right? Even when it's like like psychopath, you either see them enjoy it, you see some kind of strange or something. They're like scrunching their face before they swing mm. full force. Joel is dead. He's, it's he's so creepy. Inside, yeah. Right? Stabs him, no facial expression. Smashes the dude's head in, no facial expression. Nothing. He doesn't fucking care. And so Joel, now that he knows where that their commune is, makes his way there but we cut back to the steakhouse and ellie is hiding from david and it's kind of a indoor kind of wild goose not wild goose chase but there he's stalking her and she's trying to hide she throws this log from the fireplace at him misses but it catches a curtain on fire but now the whole steakhouse is burning up and he's giving his bad guy monologue (laughs) in the situation where he's just like, I don't give a fuck anything or any of this shit. Like, I want you, I got to have you, you're like mine. And then even that point of what he's alluding to is he's going to rape her. Yeah. And he's just like, I like him when they fight back. And she's screaming for her life because he has her pinned down. But he, I think she she ran up and stabbed him earlier with mm-hmm. her her little knife, and made him drop that cleaver. Now when when he's has her pinned down, she he's like ripping her clothes off, and she reaches up and grabs that fucking cleaver and fucking smacks him. He falls over. She jumps up top of him, and then the flames get bigger and brighter and stronger, and she does not stop chopping his fucking face in and it's just she goes that joel berserk mode yeah she goes there and she leaves the fire the burning building on her own and she's in complete shock and that's where joel catches her he's late but he sees her alive and he embraces her and he calls her baby girl yeah and he hasn't said that since he called his daughter that because she's like, you're safe now. You're safe now, baby girl. Cut to black. And you're just like, yeah. Yo, it's Whoa. You're, you're watching Ellie's Joel moment. 
yeah. of her losing her humanity now. And it, that whole thing of watching that preacher just the, with the whole building burning down is like an allegory to hell. Mm, like it's hell. Mm, mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. He, he was Satan. He was like the fallen angel. Yeah. And like he's being revealed. Like this is who he truly is. Like his true self was revealed when everything was burning down. Right. Because he, I think he also said that he became who he was he, after the apocalypse. He said it was a blessing. Yes. He said it was a blessing because he understands the cordyceps. Because he's that kind of control freak narcissist mm -hmm. that he wants to get into people's minds and control them. And this was what the creators of the show were talking about on the, their podcast. It's like, look, we make no qualms about it. The last episode, you saw communism work. Yeah. And I'm showing you theocracy has its flaws. But in reality, he's saying like, you know, we see how theocracy works like in other countries or even the way the, the Christian right politically works, even in our own country. And the thing with religious people in power, whether it's a the theocracy or just a church organization, is that you need a dynamic speaker, preacher, that usually mostly comes with narcissistic personality disorder. Yeah. So you have these religious organizations run by people who aren't exactly qualified to run it, but they're just larger in life. People are still drawn to that because they're prophets. Yeah, they're that prophets, like the people who could lead them through, through something that they can't understand. And yeah, it was it was quite interesting because it's not that way because they're religious. They they were dealt a bad card. Their location because they're in a resort. What was a resort? I guess at the beginning of you know when all the shit went down with the apocalypse like they found this resort that was like secluded and all that and it's a perfect place to be in the summer but in the winter there's nothing yeah there's no deer to hunt or anything you know because it's too cold they've probably all migrated you know and so they suffer and what we see is because while joel was out looking for ellie they're eating humans yeah they're straight up eating humans and not telling anybody. So when you watch this the second time and you already had a clear context of what's going through, didn't it, wasn't it all even creepier? No, a hundred percent. Because of what they're hiding. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like watching it all over again and watching people just eat that meal. They don't know what the fuck is going yeah. on. Like some people are scarfing it down, but the people who know are like just eating the soup and the tomatoes. Yeah. Like it was weird. Like. You know, when they, when things are attached to religion, obviously it hits a, a spot that we kind of grew up in, right? Mm -hmm. And he, David reminds me of like in the Bible of the false, false prophet, mm -hmm. right? It's, mm -hmm. you think it's Jesus Christ, but he's Satan. Yeah. Right. And like I said, when that whole building came burning down, it was almost like a reveal of like the, the curtain that was unveiled. It's like, yeah. this isn't heaven. This is hell. This is hell. And this, and I'm in control of it. I'm Satan. And it was mm. fucking creepy as hell to me, just watching that whole thing going down. And even when I, when I went back and I watched it the second time, watching Ellie hold the gun, shoot, and try to control the situation, she was just an amateur version of Joel. She's yes. trying to reflect everything Joel would do. Yeah. You know, being the boss, saying things very firmly, but she's so novice and amateur at it, she's fumbling through everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So she's just like a little baby version of him. And you see her starting to morph into him a little bit, you know? But that growth and morphing into that in order to survive is incredibly tragic. Yeah. And what you have to go through to lose your humanity that way, you know, but you, it makes you stronger, it makes you survive, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was one, that was probably the best episode of this season for me. Dude, it was, it was creepy. It was sad. It was, it answered a it lot of mysterious. questions. Mysterious. It was like, it was so much. And that guy who played David, fucking killed it <laughs> that's what i'm saying yeah the guy who played james plays joel in the video game he's the voice actor oh okay. really yeah yeah yeah. that's crazy oh what the fuck yeah. i didn't even know that so there's Easter these egg. little cameos from people who are in the game playing different roles in the show that's what, what i'm like and this is what i'm talking about like the the caliber of acting in this um even think about the two guys that died uh, that that joe murdered yeah yeah the be, that joe being murdered. tortured dude that's that's, that's the best lot. dying i've ever seen in my life yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know they 
everybody fucking kills it in this in this project for sure. Because good writing doesn't matter if there's no good acting that's involved yep. with it, and the other way around too. Yep, yep. You know, and I'm I, I'm really getting to see. I've been watching a lot of like bad shit recently, <laughs> um, just because people have asked us to watch bad things, and I I sometimes I get lost. I'm like, is this because of the writing or is it because of the acting? Right. You know, right. is like could because somebody who's a really good actor could they have executed this? Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I sometimes I can't tell, but this thing everything is meshing so well together. And like, I feel for every character, even when I don't even know them, Mm. (laughs) you know, because they make it so visceral and real, real, like, or it it kind of reminds me of sometimes like who would, it makes me think, who would I be in this apocalypse? Mm. You know, would I want to be somebody who was a leader? Would I just be a follower? Or like if I was in Fedra, like in Ellie's case, right? Where he said like, just do fucking well. And then you'll just work an office job and you'll, you don't even have to worry about what's going on out there. Would I be that person? Could I just ignore everything? It makes me wonder what my place would be in this like despotic world. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And yeah, so I thought these last, the the last, the six, seven, eight were interesting episodes for us to start opening up and see these three different situations. You know, what federal was really like, you know, and then what a communist commune is like. And then what this theocracy is like, because yeah, if if we just lost our federal government, people will huddle together anyway, yeah, and figure out their own little city states, and then have to come up with their own laws and their own way to get together. And you're 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 seeing the difference of why the commune, the communist commune, worked. The Tommy's wife, I can't what her name is. Um, yeah, I forget, but she says that she was the district attorney. You know, and then when she lost her kid and all that, and the thing is, everything about who she is and what she knows is the law and how important the law is. And it was the separation of church and state. You know, with a theocracy, it is the marriage of church and state. Yeah. And the writers were very intentionally trying to show, like, look, there's these flaws here too. Although, even like, a utopic communist country doesn't exist either. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. it's like at the same time, it's just like you got to look at it as just sci-fi mm-hmm, in the way mm-hmm. it is. And so now we're coming into episode nine, the last episode. Oof. The opening scene, a pregnant woman is running for her life. She finds this abandoned rotten home. She tries to block the door in and she just waits in the corner and she has Ellie's knife, right? And then, yeah, a zombie busts through the door and they she fights it off, stabs that zombie in the head with that knife, and then it dies. But then you see she's been bit on her leg. And at the same time, in that fight, she just popped out the baby. Yeah. And she gathers the baby up. She cuts the umbilical cord, brings the baby in, and then says, Ellie, you're so strong. (laughs) You know, and it's like, oh, shit. And I don't know to you if the actress playing the pregnant lady is familiar, but she is the voice of Ellie in the video game 10 years ago. And now she's playing Ellie's mom. Isn't that beautiful? How fucking crazy is that? Yeah. Like the guys who made this were just like so spot on on these things. So they say they wrote this from the game, right? But it's not interactive yeah. at all. It would have been this really long cutscene. So they took it out of the game. And then they're like, it's way too important. Like you just got to put it in the show. So they added this, this scene. And then we see someone familiar, Marlene, the Firefly yeah. leader. And she comes up the stairs and sees um her like with a baby and they're cautious because she's clearly bit she lies to her and she says i got bit after i cut the cord yeah after you have to let her live and then she asks marlene to shoot her like kill her and she can't so she walks away with the baby hands the baby to the soldier and you can hear her screaming marlene just begging. Begging to kill her. 
she runs back in with tears in her eyes and just, you know, and we cut to present. And I think some time has passed again. Um, and where they're walking towards, are they already walking towards a city now? It's like a city. It's like this I think it's Colorado State University. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're at a college because they have that dialogue where she's like, what the hell is college? And yeah. it's like, it's where people go to figure out who they want to be and what they want to do with their life. And Ellie says, figure out what they want to do with their life. Yeah. <laughs> and you think about it like, huh, this whole thing with college and the way it is in America or in many places, at the end of the day, it does sound so extracurricular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then we do it like our life depends on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, like we've been told, like this is the most important thing you have to do. You know, what's interesting about this episode, like his Joel's fucking personality is so different. Mm, how he treats right. her, how he speaks to her. Yeah. It's almost like he's, he's Ellie now. Mm, and Ellie is switched. him. You're right. Because look in the beginning, he's trying to tell her jokes. He's mm. trying to get her to laugh. Chef Boyardee. Exactly. Right? You know what I mean? Shit. Teach he, you how to play guitar. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. He's just, right. he's, they kind of like flip positions and she kind of feels indifferent. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. their, their roles kind of flipped and I'm like, oh, he's like vying for her attention and love, which wasn't there before. You know, yeah. it didn't because seem of like the thought that he almost lost her. Mm -hmm. It didn't seem buddy, buddy. It was because before Ellie was trying to get it. And now, like, I think what people would kind of expect is them now being on the same page where they're just like a loving relationship. But you kind of don't see that. You kind of see Joel being Ellie, mm. you know, mm. like, hey, this is being the yapper. This? Yeah. He's like talking. He's yapping so fucking much trying to fill in the silence and this weird void. But Ellie is still reeling from the trauma of what happened in the last episode. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what we're seeing. But then a beautiful scene happens. Um, it's like shot for shot from the game. I remember seeing this clip when they find the giraffe. Oh yeah, all the animals. Yeah, like um, I think that brings back a lot of the humanity into Ellie. But Ellie going through what she had just went through talks about how far they've come already. And she reiterates, like, we're seeing this through. We've come this far. We're going to go through with it. I'm going through with it all the way. We need to find the fireflies. So they head back down. They find, like, an um, emergency, like, medical encampment that's been abandoned. And they get into the conversation about Joel's scar on his head. And he had... Previously, I guess, told her that somebody had tried to shoot him and he killed him instead. And then he clarifies that actually, you know, I tried to it was myself him. after his daughter had died, you know. Um, and then he says that he flinched the last second and so he missed shooting himself. So he, he survived. And then he says, he's kind of, giving that same platitude. It's like, I moved on and I kept living. I just kept trying to survive. Was, I guess that was a good enough reason. And she's like, oh, I get it. Like time heals all wounds. And he looks at her and he's like, it wasn't time. And it's unspoken. Clearly Joel's saying like, Ellie healed. Yeah. You know? And okay. And then they kind of break the tension because they're both not that vulnerable type to each other yet so it's that dad joke moment yeah. again and when i saw that dad joke moment i'm like dude this guy is soft <laughs> i was like look at him dude he found like on? his love again like he yeah. found his reason for living again yeah and for me that's such a it's i'm happy for him but it's it's a bad sign because he's still a monster mm. you know mm. but like i said people are scared of the person who has People, you think you're scared of the person who has nothing to live for. You should be scared of the person who has, has something, to something to live for. To, something to, to lose. lose. Yeah. That is the most frightening person, especially in this world where that one thing that he can't lose is his one person. He is a, now, if you were scared of him before, you should be scared of him now. Yeah. You know? So as they're walking away from the medical encampment, um, we see some foot soldiers walking in the background, creeping up on them. 
and they fucking counter strike their ass, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> like, flash bomb, flash bomb, um, knock them out. Joel wakes up in the college medical campus and Marlene's there waiting for him to wake up, you know, and she's like, Hey, everything's good. And all this stuff, like, can't believe you made it this far, you know, like, I literally didn't think you were going to make it, da, 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 da. And he's like, oh, I was all Ellie. And, you know, she's trying to, like, be like, okay, you can be on your way. And he's like, wait, what? where's Ellie? Yeah. Right? And he's like, well, they're prepping her for surgery. Like, surgery for what? Like, And then she explains the science of how the doctor can manipulate whatever cordyceps that's in her since birth that sends these signals to be immune to cordyceps that come into the body. And then Joel says, but it grows in the brain. Like, I know, (laughs) right? And he starts flipping out. So they got to fucking subdue him for a second. And he's begging at that point, like, you don't understand. And she says, I do understand. She does understand more than anybody because she was there the day she was born. Yeah. And she had to kill her own friend. Yeah, but the thing is, her friend also asked her to save her daughter's life, to help her live. Yeah. But because of this cure, she's going against what her best friend says to save Ellie's life and to kill her to save the world. So she's like, I understand exactly what you're going through, but I'm making this decision. We have to do this, you know, so we can end this. We could save the world. And there's no option for Joel. They've taken his weapon, so they march him out. But in the stairwell, fucking bing, bang, boom, fucks them up, shoots one guy, shoots the other guy in the leg, says, where is she? He's like, fuck you. I don't have time for this. Boom. Boom. Blast him. You know what's interesting, too? Goes on his rampage. I, I was talking you know, earlier about Joel's reputation, mm-hmm. right? And do you remember what she said to him? She goes, out of all the people that were going to bring her here, he was like, I, I never want it to be you. She was like, I do not want to be in debt to, to you, you of all people. His reputation is nuts. Yeah. You got to understand that, right? She looks at him like, fuck. And I think because of the game being interactive, if you did play the game, mm-hmm. that's you. Yeah. You're the one doing all the killing. Mm-hmm. So you would understand what they, that when they talk about his reputation. Now, this is part of the, this is one of the most, oh, video game aspects of the show to this point is when he goes on his rampage and he kills everybody. No, not like completely, but like he goes at anybody up, up in front of him, he's taking them out like you would in a video game. But what you're hearing is sad music yeah the score is this sad cello like what joel is doing is a tragedy he for him save the world or save ellie easiest choice in the world yeah save ellie for him it's that's it we've seen him in his panic attacks because you know of him being a failure and losing and he almost lost ellie again and she got herself out of that and you could see his response to that after she had saved his life. It's a no-brainer for him. Like, fuck the world. This is it. He cannot lose anymore. He can't lose anything anymore. You know? And he goes back and just does a rampage. The guy fucking puts his gun down, puts his hands up to surrender. Pow. Pow. Saving Private Ryan, like, like just kills him. And then he gets to the fucking operating room and there's these nurses and a doctor there and he finds Ellie and he's like, release her. And doctor's like, grabs a scalpel. I'm not gonna let you take her. Boom. Killed the only man on this fucking planet who could save the world. That he was, does not give a fuck. <laughs> that was the biggest tell sign. When he killed, the, I actually thought, I was like, well, the doctor's going to live. Yeah. You know? Give him another shot. <laughs> like, I said, give a fuck. Yeah. Give Kills him a real shot. The last chance that anybody has of survival and he doesn't fucking care. You know, when we talk, when we see something 
we, you know, we've talked about narcissism, <laughs> you know, this is something else. This is like, there's narcissism. And then there's this, like this guy is just fighting. Everything is for himself. It seemingly seems like it's for Ellie. Yeah. It's for his sanity. Yes. I cannot fail. It's not, I want to save Ellie. I can't lose again. I can't lose, you know? Nothing fucking, literally nothing fucking matters at this point. And then you see it towards the end. This is the part where I was like, okay, they're at the standstill. He's holding Ellie, right? She's in a robe. And then who's there? Marlene. Marlene is there. Marlene is right there. And listen, this is such a weird moment, right? Because throughout this whole storyline, we've gotten to know Joel. We've gotten to know Ellie. We get to see who he is. We've humanized him, all this other stuff, right? But- we're literally, we, we are forgetting that this is still the end of the fucking world. Mm. This is the end of the yeah. fucking world. Yeah. And the savior is Ellie, right? Here, the, the weird conflicting part about this, and you're going to see this towards the end, is that nobody is considering what Ellie wants. Yeah. Yeah. The conversation isn't even brought up. It's just save the world or, or Joel is going to fail at his mission. And that's really about it. And then you just have this person in the middle who's just dangling in Joel's arm, but nobody's asking, what is, what does Ellie want? Even Marlene didn't give her the option. But she said they didn't even tell her what they're going to do to her. Mm -hmm. They just put her to sleep. And so she wouldn't even know what the fuck was going to happen to her. That and she wouldn't that, have wake, woken up. Also, in hearing that conversation that Ellie was having with Joel, I'm a hundred percent sure Ellie would have said yes. Mm -hmm. I, if I felt. Yeah. Cause <laughs> at that, after that drive scene, she was telling him, yeah. I'm seeing this through 100%. You yeah. came this far. But I think Joel, knowing if if Ellie were to be given an option, she would she do it. Would have done it to finally have a reason for having lived this weird, fucked up life in this reality. To have to have murdered people, to have yeah. killed people, you know, all of that. And she has a purpose and reason. But then Joel's like, "But you're my purpose and reason." Yeah, yeah. And so that's why there's the sad music playing. And what Marlene calls out is that you can't protect her forever. People, and there's this is interesting that they took out from the game. They said somebody else will be after her. You know, who's next? If the cordyceps don't come after her, you know, marauders, murderers. And in the game, she says rapists. Right? But they took it out on the show, mm. which I thought was weird. Like literally the last episode, like yeah, she, she almost got, raped, you know, raped. Yeah. Um, and she's trying to reality check Joel. But she's sitting there giving a man an option when he's already made up his mind. Yeah. And so, bow, he shoots her. And then, but what happens is it cuts to him in the car. And she wakes up from a daze like, what the fuck? What's going on? Where are my clothes? And then he tells this fabricated lie. He says that there was a bunch of other people just like you and they couldn't find a cure. So they stopped the program. But when you were under, raiders came, you had to fight them off. There was no time. So that's why we're here. <laughs> it's like, I mean, Ellie's not that stupid. Well, Ellie's smart. Yeah. She knows something is up. You know? She's like, well, what happened to Marlene? She's like, is that all right. Like, yeah. She's like, yeah. And then she just goes back to sleep and he says, I'm sorry. Flash back to what happened. She calls out to him one more time, you know. But <laughs> this is Joel thinking ahead to how she's like, let me live. Please just let me live. You'll just come after us. You'll just come after us. Heartless, dude. Yeah. This is this. So when you see them, you know, at the towards the end of this episode, they're hiking, right? They're going up in this trail. He's talking about his daughter. Joel. Obviously, now he's so nervous because he lied. Yeah. He's just fucking word vomit like yeah. a motherfucker, right? Which is unlike him. Unlike him at all. Like you thought he was weird before when he was trying to be all like lovey dovey and shit. He is panicking now. Like in his weird, it's it's like his anxiety is up, mm. right? Where he's trying to just, it's not even him trying to cheer her up. It reminded it's, me of, I don't know if it's like 
what is that called when he's just giving her this love, but it's like manipulation. Yeah. You're trying to build up this off the back of a lie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's terrible. You see his anxiety building up and it's so out of character. Remember, throughout this whole series, you know how sharp and smart Ellie is. Mm -hmm. So she asks him, you know, basically to tell her the truth. And she's giving him a chance to be honest. And what does he do? Fucking lies. Lies again. It's like when she tries to speak to him for real. Have a, like, cause yeah, so much of the beginning of the relationship is just her bullshitting all the time. Sarcasm. Yeah. 24 seven. And this is, you know, why Ellie chose Joel to, why she was attached to Joel was because she was saying everybody leaves her. She said, um, I, I'm so sorry, I forgot her girl's name. <laughs> the girl she kissed back at the mall, Tess, you know, and Marlene now or whatever. Or she said some another, another name, like a third person. I don't know why it's blinking, but oh, Sam, the deaf kid. Mm -hmm. And then her point was that Joel never left her and that's why she chooses him. But then he starts giving these platitudes, you know, about once again, yeah, you know, you lose somebody, but then you just got to keep going and then you'll find somebody new, you know? And she's like, oh, like you could see it in her face. She's like, this is not what she's trying to hear from him right now. But then like he's building, saying all this shit off the back of a lie. So she finally just says it to his fucking face. Like, is everything you said about the fireflies true? And this like, it's simple dialogue. Is this true? And he says, yes. Okay. And they walk, right? But everything in between those lies is what you have to read in their fucking faces. Yeah. We know Joel's lying, but does Ellie believe Joel in that very last shot of her, right? And the way I read it just felt like she just doesn't believe him. Yeah. But she smart. is. And I think the seed was actually planted in the episode, uh, Tommy's wife. Remember the advice that she gave her? Right. It's like the people who are closest to you, not that hurt them, you know, they lie, they lie and they deceive you. They're the ones that could fuck you up the most. Mm. That was the one little advice that she gave her. Right, right. Because she right. was the one vehemently defending Joel. She was like, you don't know him. She goes, no, I right. do know him. And like, I, I know I know people like him. And she goes, look, I'm going to just say one last thing. All these other people can hurt you, but the people that are closest to you are the ones that would fuck you up the most. And then she kind of left it at that. And you could see that what she's trying to say is the reason why Tommy left Joel, mm -hmm. right? And why he's just, hey, hey, welcome back into yeah. my life, right? Yeah. And then, and like you're saying, Ellie now understands what she's talking about. Because what she said was like, that's because Tommy's stupid yeah. back then. But then it's like, wait, am I stupid? Like, she's no, smart, man. She's smart. That, that episode ending right there, I was like, God damn it. I want one more fucking episode. I want to see how this fucking unravels, man. Yo, uh, Last of Us Part Two. After rewatching this, like like I said, I played the first game and I vowed never to play again because it's too scary for me. I don't like scary games. And then I finished this and I was like, "Fuck!" Like you're saying, I want more. Yeah. And there is a part two out there. I just have to play the game and just face the, the horror. The only way aspect. I'll play this game is if I have a cheat code where I can't die. Hey, man. Right. Hey guys, write it in the comments. Do you want to see David play Last of Us <laughs> Part Two and stream it? I'm just going to be screaming watch? and it's just going to be peaking the whole time. Yeah, just screaming. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta nah, do it. This show is so damn good. They do such a good job of just tying everything so neatly yeah. and giving you just enough where you want more. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't really enjoyed a show like and i've been trying to watch a lot of things right and like i've enjoyed a lot but this show is fucking amazing yeah um and 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 the way just how the show ended up not being about zombies yeah it ended up being about the people and of humanity in when we're in survival mode 
Mm-hmm. Like, what are we down to our primal selves? Yeah, because the answer is already clear. Like, what's going to happen in a zombie movie? We're going to run away from these things that are going to try to kill us. That yeah. trope has been done a million times over. We fucking get it. Like, like I said earlier in the podcast, the biggest thing that I I have to do or that I think about in the show is what I would do in their situation. That's what I just keep thinking yeah, about. Yeah. Where would I be? Where would I be placed in this situation? Well, I've already done a sketch on being bit by a zombie. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> so I was hiding the bites. I, I, you know, I joke about this stuff, but in reality, it seems so real. I don't know where I would be placed. Mm. You know, would I would I lean towards my religious side because I need hope, and that's yeah, what religious, right. you know, that's what religion does for you. It gives you hope outside of this fucking reality that you're living in right now because you're hoping for something outside of this. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why it was interesting with David saying how he found you know, Christ or Christ or God after the, what they say the apocalypse is, mm-hmm. you know? And I think I, I told the story before about the guy I met when I was in Iraq. He was a convert after September 11th. He said after September 11th, he became a Christian. And then him find, like being guy, okay, so if I'm a Christian, like, what does this say? What am I supposed to do? And he realized the war in Iraq is unjust. And so therefore he should go there and be a missionary and yeah. live there. Crazy. And he's the guy that I learned um, to just cuss <laughs> as a Christian, whatever, fuck it. Mm-hmm. You know, because it doesn't change like what we think and feel and believe. Like this is just what we truly believe in our hearts expressed through our mouths. But yeah, like, in that way, the way I was so influenced by him because of, you know, some people radiate that energy. Like I couldn't understand me like being in David's comedy. Yeah. <laughs> Just I'm following this guy. This guy seems to get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can I go bury my mom? <laughs> I, picture, nom, nom, nom. <laughs> I picture me just like, in a in a fucking suit and tie, just doing accounting <laughs> <laughs> for Fedra. <laughs> yeah, like hey, people are dying. I was like, never heard of it. Mm-hmm. I don't know what you're talking about. Hey, I saw we still have a basketball gym. Anyone want to play some ball? Yeah. <laughs> Anyone want to hoop later? Yeah, cool. That's the thing we had to see about Fedra. It's like they have a fucking school basketball team. They're they're what we saw before was was very apocalyptic outside, but then you see what they mean by fascism and class. Mm-hmm that there's these workers down here who do this shit grunt work. And then there's the people in federal who live in the top of the high tower and get all the benefits from that. And then th- this is then translated to looking at the communist commune, how they're kind of perpetuating this uh, communist utopia yeah. in a way. It's when you listen to the HBO official podcast, the writers are like no qualms about talking about how they don't like theocracy and hey, maybe communism, <laughs> give it a shot. So they're liberal as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, communism always works out great, yeah. guys. <laughs> I've, Evidently. <laughs> yeah, I've seen, a, there was this uh, clip of this guy, um, he basically, you know, walked up to a bunch of people who were, you know, touting like socialism and communism. Mm-hmm. This guy like is from like, he escaped like, communism he's yeah. like what the fuck are you talking about <laughs> he goes you, you you don't know what the fuck you're saying he's like i've escaped communism for a reason yeah, you know a cuban yeah if you meet a cuban and you they th- hate they com- oh my god hate, that's why there's such strong trump supporters yeah it's not about you know like any of the fucking bullshit that everybody else hates about trump it's they're just cubans are just so Pro America, yeah, and Donald Trump is the one who is that guy. Yeah, 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 know? yeah. It just reminds them of of a country that and a regime that they're trying they, they try to escape. Mm-hmm. You know, so whatever is anti that, they're going to go for that. So you talk to anybody who escaped the communist country, they're just be like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" Yeah. Like, if communism was going to work, it would have worked in our country and all these other countries. But historically, it hasn't happened that way. Yeah, right. You're giving all the power to what one person, but like. What the show is trying to portray is down to its bare bones when we as idealistic no communism. More, we have no more what we have now. Yeah. And you're gonna have pockets of these different ideologies. Everybody shares everybody's equal. Mm-hmm. And so that's why they're portraying this idealistic 
version of communism. And then they show like a theocracy off the bat. In the worst way possible. In the worst way. Yeah, it's just, it doesn't work. It's because you're going to have a narcissistic leader telling people, this is what God says. So you have to listen to me. Yeah. Which is so funny that that's what they were trying to go for, but that's also communism too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're yeah. adopting that. Yeah, that's yeah. communism too. Because technically everybody's sharing their meals, mm-hmm. right? But the, you have one despotic leader that fucking- That's the thing. You still need a dictatorship in order to have a communism. Communist. Exactly. <laughs> kind of weird. It's really, yeah. So it, like every ideology has its fucking contradictions. Yeah. You know, the, um, but- I think I think another point I wanted to bring up about the show. Ah, oh, fuck! I forgot. Shit! I hate when that happens. But it was definitely had to do with the ideologies we live in, mm. down to our core, core people as human beings. And I've lost it. <laughs> okay. Well, guys, that wraps up this episode of the Genius Brain Podcast with Ed breaking down every fucking movie possible. <laughs> Every Whatever show. I forgot, I'll write it in the comments later. Yeah. yeah. Um, hope you guys enjoyed that. I know it was long awaited, but Ed was in Seattle for a whole month. And I don't like doing this with other people. Because <laughs> I don't think people watch shows like we do in this mm. in, to this extent. And right. then, you know, so um write in the comments below what you thought about the latter half of the season. Um uh let us know other stuff that you want us to review. We will be doing beef soon. We still have to do Creed. Uh, we still have to do the bear. There's a whole bunch uh, of stuff. So much. There's yeah. so many other things that I want to talk about and break down. Um, I'm really glad that you guys enjoy these film and TV breakdowns because I never actually thought people would have enjoyed this that much. <laughs> yeah. I think COVID changed everything because everybody fell into TV culture and yeah. stream culture. You know so. what I also found out from reading in the comments is that I think we're also uh, crazy people because <laughs> 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 I don't think people watch things the way that we do. We do. And you right. watch things more intensely than I do. So I, I didn't realize that, you know, because mm. when, when we say things, right, people go, oh, I never thought. I'm like, oh, shit. And I, to me, it's just, you know, some, sometimes apparent. Yeah. But maybe it's just we just, I don't I, know. I thought about that too. Like um, people will say, oh, Ed, your life is so crazy, right? And I don't, I don't necessarily think my life is any more interesting than the next person. I just think I'm a pretty good storyteller. Yeah. You know, I just make it interesting. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And as a fellow storyteller, like for us, we grew up and we were raised by television. Yes. And for people like you and I, like other kids too, but you and I were imitating it. Mm. We were recreating it. And so when we were doing that, we were deconstructing it and reverse engineering it as we made it ourselves. You know so what that's I- why we understand what we're seeing now. You know I, what I realized been, too? What, how many years? Most people don't rewatch things. They never, uh-huh. they never grew yeah. up like us. Right. We had to rewatch things. Just to put it in perspective, uh, before you know the the digitization of media. Yeah. Right. Um, obviously, this is even before our time. So, for example, my my one of my former bosses from the men's warehouse, we we still keep in contact to this day, and he was telling me he remembers um, waiting in line to watch the uh, the first Star Wars. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah, and he waited a whole day to watch that shit, and then the next day he waited another whole day to watch it. And he waited in line for twenty four hours to watch the shit, and he watched it three times yeah. in theaters over and over and over again. Like when you watch like amazing things, they weren't coming out every other right. day, every hour on the hour. There's so much out there, and it's overwhelming when they say, "Have you seen this? Have you seen this? Have you exactly. seen this?" Yeah, people would sit and they would watch stuff and they would enjoy it over and over again. And on top of that, when we watch the film. Guess how long it would take to, to, to go to fucking VHS? It would be like a year and a half. Oh God, it took forever remember back that? in the day. Yeah. Like I remember for Jurassic Park, I was waiting for this it fucking VHS. It took forever. Yeah. And like what, and the thing was Blockbuster would always get it first. You couldn't buy it. Mm-hmm. You could only rent it at the time. So it was, movies were very exclusive back yeah. in the day. And it's so accessible now. And there's content everywhere. Like even just on YouTube, people, people put up their, whole hour long i mean this podcast being like that long too it's like you can put up anything like your entire stand-up special your entire movie Mm -hmm. but the fact is like there's so much content that we get overwhelmed when people tell us to see stuff too yeah oh we have this and this and this too but at the same time 
the quality of the wide range of content is much better. Yeah. Because comment sections, mm-hmm. because social media can fucking blast it. So standard for what's a good movie and a and a whatever movie. Now it's like there's a clear line drawn would be like what to expect and what you're watching. Yeah. Yeah. And so a lot of people to having ex- access to, you know, podcasts like this help them learn and understand and translate what they're seeing on the screen, you know? So like, I think it's just great for film culture in general, because really when we do this, we want people to understand why we love something. Mm -hmm. And when you learn to love it, like we do too, you can go out there, check something else out and learn how to love it on your own. Yeah. And then find your own reasons and draw your own opinions as well. Yeah. And it's okay to expect more from the things that you're watching too, yeah, right? And I think that one of the things that maybe I dislike is when people give excuses to films. Um, for being poor quality. Yeah, just for being shit. Yeah. You know, they go, well, I can't do it. Well, just because you can't do it doesn't mean that you're in their position. You know what yeah. I mean? It's They're- a Marvel film. What did you expect? Yeah. That excuse, like, but they used to make bangers. Exactly. <laughs> so if it wasn't done great before, I'd understand, right? Like yeah. this is like a certain standard, but we've already picked and named a whole bunch that do what the, the things that we're saying is missing in yeah. these terrible films. Yeah, I feel that way with X-Men movies. It's a crapshoot. It might be shit and it might be fucking great. And, yeah. And so when I saw Fox Marvel, then I knew, oh, it's not MCU. And then mm-hmm. I'd have a lower standard for them. Yeah. Right. I mean, like, oh, I don't know if I ever brought this up, but did you know, we ran a video rental store. You, your parents did? Yeah, it's just like Jay and Silent Bob, like Clerks. Oh, for real? There's a quick stop, like a, a convenience store, next door, video store with movies oh, what and the stuff. fuck? So it was open for a few years, so like from all throughout middle school to high school. After school every day, I, I have to go to the store with my dad on his shift. And then I go next door and I'm in, I'm fucking seventh grade. How old am I? I'm 12, 13 years old and I'm running the video store. And every fucking movie I ever, I dreamed of as a poor kid, my dad finally having this business. It was a dream come true. And now I had every movie I wanted at my disposal and all the movies my dad wouldn't let me watch. They were just like, let me watch anything. Oh, wow. So in seventh grade, I saw Boogie Nights. That's why I was so That's, influenced by that movie. Yeah, yeah, and I yeah. still think it's such an amazing film. You know, it was one of the most influential movies to me in that day. But that's where I learned, like, so you know, I saw Super Mario Brothers, right? And I fucking loved it. Because the thing is, it made me flash back to 1993 when I went to go see it with my dad in Flint, Michigan. And he fucking hated it. And he let me know because he's an asshole like that. <laughs> and I'm, in, I'm seven years old. <laughs> and because he hated it so much after it came out on VHS, he wouldn't let us rent it. The John Leguizamo one? Yeah. Why did he hate it so much? Because it, it's fucking bad. He knew it was bad. Oh, for sure. Yeah. My dad was a big film buff. Oh, okay. like Yeah. So that, I, I think it was his big dream to do his own video on the store because he fucking hated Blockbuster. You know, like uh, paying money to rent. And so I was like, now I got my own store. So that's how we grew up loving like movies too. So every day after school, I get there at like three or 4 p.m. We close at 9 p.m. I'm watching movies and doing my homework. And that's where I learned to like differentiate because I put in Super Mario Brothers again and I learned this movie's fucking shit. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Because when we grow up and we're kids of immigrants and we grow up with a TV and whatever's just on the first 13 channels, right? Everyone in pop culture, from SNL to Friends and sitcoms, all that, they have a Godfather reference, a Goodfellow reference, these movie references, like, what are they talking about? So I have these movies now. So I watch Godfather and I watch Goodfellas and I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) This is good. Yeah. And Mario Brothers is shit. (laughs) Oh, Street Fighter fucking sucks. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) What's up, my review in the bad film? That's when I really. I had a fast track with my film love was because like all the kids movies I left behind, you know, rewatching Power Rangers movies and you're like, oh man, this is pretty Dude, bad. Did you know they brought out a new Power Rangers movie? Yeah. With the original cast? What? 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 With with uh, Billy and Zach? Uh, dude, it's- Oh, it was a comeback special, right? Let me tell you something. Probably top 
five worst things I've ever seen <laughs> in my life. <laughs> All right. We got to watch that. It's on Netflix. Yeah. The first scene that you'll see alone, you're going to die laughing. Okay. <laughs> like just to set it up, right? Somebody dies. And you know when somebody dies, right? You see emotions or something, right? The person dies. They're just like, oh man, they're dead. And they just go <laughs> oh, to another no. scene. <laughs> I fucking died laughing. Oh my god! Some of the worst acting I've ever seen in my life. But yeah, like, but how do you know it's bad? Because you've seen so much that's good. Yeah, you know. And so, it, with through all this shit, like, wow, this is a long-winded closing. But <laughs> just to say, like, I'm super thankful that I keep getting to come back and keep talking about movies. Because before this, I used to write long ass fucking essays and dissertations on Facebook. <laughs> Like paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs breaking down movies because I couldn't get it off my chest. Yeah. And then I come here and then you gave me this space to finally fucking talk about The Matrix. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Get it off my fucking chest. I'll be trying to talk but, about yeah. movies to Mario and I'd never seen somebody just fall out of love with a person. <laughs> <laughs> she fucking it's, hates it. Yeah. She fucking, but I'll tell you this though, because of the way that I'm watching things now and now she's watching things with me, she said that I ruined things for her now. Uh, Cause she's seeing things. She goes, she's seeing what's a faux pas in film. Like yeah. what's not like, right. Why do they do yeah. that? That doesn't make any sense. This is so dumb. And she's like, she's like these, um, Korean dramas are not as enjoyable as they used to be. <laughs> right. Cause she fucking opened, I, opened up, I just kind of opened it up a little bit. <laughs> Cause she didn't understand. She goes, why can't you just enjoy it? I was like, listen, once that door's open, you can't close it. Yeah. Right. It's just dumb. We're not like trying to make you, make make people like ruin content for other people but understand the standard <laughs> yeah yeah and you gotta understand too i like a lot of dumb shit like i said yeah. one of my favorite movies of all time is nacho libre nacho libre man you know so Something it's not like shit. i don't like dumb things crippled avengers <laughs> crippled avengers too <laughs> oh, okay crazy that shit is. yo you guys go find that on amazon go Prime. on amazon and watch crippled avengers and thank us later it's fucking <laughs> the most ridiculous it's basically like instagram fucking uh real comedy put into a film <laughs> But what's crazy is how you can see Tarantino's influenced by it. Mm -mm, mm. Like you're like, oh shit, Tarantino bit that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. When you okay, so. the ultimate biter, by the way. Yeah, uh, yeah. But you guys could catch Jesus Brain every Sundays at 12 p.m. and you could catch Ed at Ed Park VP and not breakfast at Momos, but Bible study, Bible at, study Momos. at Momos. Yeah, um, Jesus Brain every Sunday at 12 p.m. We'll see you all next time. Peace. Peace.